Between the making of a watch and actually using a watch, there's one step that is extremely important, and that is the quality control. That is what ensures that everything that we as watchmakers were trying to accomplish, we actually achieved. The timing is good, the water resistance is good, and visually, the timepiece is perfect. Every watchmaker and every brand is going to have a different quality control standard, but the process will be relatively identical to other watchmakers. After a watch has been serviced and repaired, or after a watch has been made for the first time, it will be complete, meaning all of its pieces have been put together, all of the timing has been done by the watchmaker, water resistance checks have been done, and then it will be passed on to the next person in line. And that is quality control. The first step in quality control is going to be checking for any visual imperfections. The watchmaker will have looked at that watch under magnification using a loop and maybe even a microscope. So when it gets to the quality control technician, their job is not to look at it under magnification, but to look at it with the naked eye. The typical test is about 12 inches from your face with regular light. So nothing over the top, no special lighting or special magnifiers, simply holding the watch 12 inches from your eyeballs and looking at it, making sure that there's nothing under the crystal, no piece of dust, no little fuzz or hair or lint or anything like that. Checking both sides, the back, if there's a display back, and also the dial. Also making sure there's no scratches on the case, making sure the crown is aligned properly and has the right gap between the case, making sure the crystals sit level. And all of this is performed with no magnification. The next visual checks are alignment of the hands. To perform that test, we will put the hour hand to six and see if the minute hand aligns at 60 or 12. We can check and see how many minutes the alignment is off by. And again, this is all brand specific. The lower the price, the lower the quality control. If a watch has a date mechanism or a chronograph, these are also things that are checked. We need to make sure the date jumps within the right amount of time. All of these things have written standards. Chronograph hands need to reset to zero. Perpetual calendars will also have to jump at all of the right times. After visual checks are done, that's when some tactile checks can be done, making sure that the crown feels right, making sure that the winding feels right. Then we can move on to timing tests. The first test for a manually wound watch will be fully winding it and checking the daily rate. We'll also look at the amplitude and the beat error and make sure that all of this is within tolerance. Now with the right equipment, we can simply wind the watch fully, place it onto the timing machine, and it will automatically go through all of the positions and it will reference our known tolerances for each position and give us a green check mark if it has passed that test or a red X if it has failed that test. If it passes that test, then it can move on to going on to a cyclo test or a winder of sorts. This will then test that timekeeping over an extended period of time because a watch might work perfect when it is on the timing machine. However, if the wrong wheel 
was placed in a watch, it might actually be running fast or slow. But the tick-tock noises of the escapement that the timing machine is relying on will appear to be perfect. Or if there was one damaged tooth on a wheel and that wheel turns around once every day, it will take a whole 24 hours to discover that that tooth has damage and the watch stops at that point. So we will take our watch and put it on a cyclotest, which spins the watch around into all positions while it's running. We set the time to a reference time, and then we can check again in 24 hours. See how much deviation there was, see if maybe the watch stopped or is running fast. If this is within spec, then we can put it back on the timing machine and we can check the 24 hour test, which means we have lower power. The mainspring has now used up 24 hours worth of power. So there's less tension in the mainspring, meaning less torque traveling through the gear train. And we wanna make sure that the accuracy of the timekeeping has not gone outside of our tolerance range after that 24 hour period. So this will be a second set of automated tests on the timing machine. If it passes that test, we will then fully wind it once again and place it back on the cyclo test. We will let it run for two days and make sure that the power reserve that we are supposed to have is actually happening in real life. So at this point, if the timepiece has passed the visual inspection, the mechanical inspection, and also the timing tests and cyclo test, we can then move on to water resistance testing. Water resistance testing varies based on the watch. If it's a dive watch, it's gonna be a lot more stringent. If it is a watch just intended to be able to get wet or maybe a watch that is a dress watch that's not intended for use in the water at all regardless all of those watches will be tested to some kind of pressure to make sure that the gaskets have been seated properly make sure that everything is sealed the way it should be there are dry tests in a small chamber that can be pressurized and also have a vacuum. And then there are tests that are wet tests. A wet test will be used to either find a leak that becomes apparent from the dry test, or if you're working with a very deep dive specific watch, that watch will need to go into a wet pressure chamber for an extended period of time. The dry pressure test will actually use sensors to touch the front and the back of the watch. And then the chamber will be pressurized, meaning air is forced into the chamber. And when air is forced into the chamber, that pressure will try to squeeze the watch or crush the watch. Now, this deflection is really minimal. Just a few microns. Inside of this pressure chamber, we actually measure the amount that the case deforms under pressure. And then it will sit in that pressure chamber for a specific amount of time. And if it starts to expand again and go back to its normal shape, the unpressurized shape, that means that there is a leak because the air pressure on the outside is making its way into the case. So that's how the dry chamber works, is by sensing the flex of the case under pressure or under vacuum, meaning the case will expand. And if it contracts, while we still have a vacuum in that chamber, that means we have a leak. So those two tests can be done completely dry so that we have no risk of water getting into the watch and damaging it. When we're working with an automatic watch, we have a few additional tests we have to run. One of them is making sure that the watch will actually wind itself. So we take a watch that has not been running 
there is no wind on the mainspring. We place it onto the cyclotest. We turn that on for eight hours, and that should fully wind that automatic watch. Some watches have different lengths of time. They have to be on the cyclotest to fully wind them. But most typical calibers are gonna be eight hours. So after eight hours on the cyclotest from empty, we should have a fully wound mainspring. Meaning we can now set the time and place the watch on our workbench stationary for the next two days or maybe longer, depending on the specified power reserve for that movement. And when we come back to it, it should still be running. This allows us to know that the automatic mechanism is indeed winding up the watch and able to keep the watch running. So for an automatic watch, we will actually add two to three days of additional quality control just to test the automatic mechanism. So after all of those quality control tests, that's when a watch is actually ready to receive its strap or bracelet. And then it could be picked up or shipped out. It's ready to go, ready to be worn, and ready to function exactly as it was intended.